Lizards are the most successful and diverse group of reptiles on the planet, living pretty much every place imaginable. But one species that I've always wanted to see has taken this adaptive radiation a step further. Or should I say, deeper. On today's adventure, we're searching Florida's scrub ecosystem for a very unique but extremely cryptic lizard that is rarely seen above ground. To locate this species, we have two primary search methods. One is searching underneath cover objects where they might be thermoregulating, and two is actually following the trackways that they leave in the sand as they move. First, we tried our luck with some cover objects, and it wasn't long until we started finding some lizards. Now, this by far is the most common lizard that we have seen so far. This is actually an invasive brown anole. This is one of the very first invasive reptiles we think that were introduced to Florida, likely arriving on plants shipped in from the Caribbean islands as early as the 1700s. Now, brown anoles as an invasive species directly compete with our native green anoles for insects. And this I think is an immature male or a female, but the mature males also have this impressive dewlap, just like our native green anoles that they will use in mating displays. So we'll take care of this little guy and keep searching for our native lizards. While we were finding plenty of anoles and invertebrates using the artificial cover here, we weren't seeing pretty much any signs of activity from our target species. So we decided to switch up our search tactics and start to look for visual signs of their activity. This led us to explore a xeric sand ridge nearby. And as we poked around some gopher tortoise burrows searching for trackways, we spotted something completely unexpected. This amphibian right here is something that I have never seen before in the wild. And it's one of the species that you know exists in association with gopher tortoises, but not one that is frequently encountered. This is the gopher frog, which is considered one of the most specialized frog species that we get here in the southeastern U.S., only occurring in association with these like sandy scrub habitats and longleaf pine savanna. It's pretty much it. Now, this species has a biphasic life cycle. They are, of course, born in the water like all frogs are. As adults, they will actually spend the dry parts of the year, not in wetlands like you might think, but here in the uplands. So this individual we found on this gopher tortoise burrow apron, and gopher tortoise burrows are one example of the many kinds of underground refugia that adult gopher frogs use during the dry season. Now, that might not do very much during the dry season. They're basically in a state of estivation until those winter or early spring rains come back, and then the adults will mass migrate down to the ephemeral wetlands where they will reproduce and hopefully have enough offspring to provide for the next generation of gopher frogs. So because this species uses uplands and also wetlands, it's really important that we have connectivity between those two different habitat types if we want to keep populations of gopher frogs stable. This is an awesome find. This means that we're definitely in the right kind of habitat. Now it's just a numbers game to see if we can encounter one of those really sought after sandhill species. But honestly, this is one of them too. That's a really special find. After a lifer like that, I was sure that our luck was totally spent. But as we continued down the sand ridge, we spotted a few more pieces of artificial cover decorating the sugary white sand. And that is when this happened. Yeah, it's James. No way. Yeah, no yeah, freaking yeah. way. Got one, got one. <gasps> no freaking way! <gasps> that is the freakiest looking thing. But he moves weird too. He's twitchy, yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't want to come out of the sand. That is so wickedly cool. Like, look, look, he just, like, this is the coolest thing. This right here is one of the most spectacular organisms we could have hoped to see. This is a sand skink, and they are maybe the most specialized skink actually that we get here in North America. For one thing, the front limbs are almost completely gone. Like I'm looking at it right now and I can't see the front two legs at all. They're super reduced in this species because this is an animal that doesn't actually use its legs for locomotion anymore. These actually laterally undulate just like a snake. So they have these really powerful muscles on their side and back that let them kind of skate through the sand or swim through the sand. Even when he's moving in my hands, he's not moving like another skink. He's moving like a snake. Now these skinks have these extremely reduced legs because they're actually mostly foraging for food under the sand. So most skinks live on the surface of the ground. These actually forge two or three inches under the sand. And so they also have really terrible vision, but what they do have is an excellent sense of smell and vibration acuity. So what these are eating is basically 100% invertebrates, especially ant larvae seems to be a favored prey item of the sand skink. I think this is a really special organism for lots of reasons, but for me, it's just really cool to see niche partitioning, which is a pretty foundational ecological concept playing out in real time between sand skinks, mole skinks, and there's even a third species that's involved in this relationship, the worm lizard, which is foraging even lower 
underground and the sand skink. But I could not be happier with this animal right here. This is a species that most people don't even get to see in their lifetime. We'll get this amazing organism right back underground. Unfortunately for sand skinks, gopher frogs, and the other incredible organisms that live in this unique sand hills ecosystem, the same uplands that are critical for their survival are also extremely valuable for development. As our human footprint continually increases here in the southeastern U.S., habitat destruction and fragmentation are taking their toll on populations of these remarkable organisms and also make it increasingly difficult to apply land management practices like prescribed burning that are critically important to maintaining the integrity of these systems. If we really do value seeing amazing organisms like these on our landscapes, we've got to start making better decisions about how we manage the land that's under our stewardship. Once these creatures and the places they live are gone, there's no putting them back. Here's your sneak peek at the species that will be featured in the next episode of The Wild Report. I'll see you next time, but until then, stay curious and keep adventuring everywhere. This is Ben Zeno of The Wild Report, signing out. Also, I enjoyed seeing everyone's guesses as to how I broke my ankle. Unfortunately, what actually happened isn't as exciting as I would have you believe. As you can see, I can now stand, at least with the boot on, um, without crutches. But I'm still getting back to walking, so... I'm working on some inventive concepts for species I can film while on crutches. But don't worry, I'm not going to become like a birder or anything. Probably.